Yes! Greetings, Mr. President. Basel Exposition, UK Ministry of Defence here. It's my pleasure to announce to you that we've approved an aid package for 100,000 rifles for your military. Oh my god! Yes, thank you! Thank you very much! The boys in the front, they need all the help we can get. Uh, uh, is there a budget? Ah, now, Mr. President, that's the best part. The people of the United Kingdom send their support for your endeavours and are happy to an open budget, with our understanding that you need an AK of your choosing. The price ranges of these rifles are generally very similar, so we'll leave the specific models up to you to determine according to your needs. Wow, thank you. For, for your country's great generosity, we will put them to good use. Um, eh, excuse me, I, I have another call. Please hold. My lord Emir, old buddy, how are you? How did you get this number? Tell you asshole, all those free lunch I send you, open your phone la. Scroll down. All the way down. You can see the good stuff. You look closely. Yes, Mr. President, contributing to your personal Ukrainian Navy. And don't you worry about Her Majesty's minions. I've got the right touch. MOD Special Projects and Financing. Have they purchased the rifles? Yes, the vendors have been paid. However, this one transaction has wiped out two years of your annual budget. What? How much was it? And who was the vendor? Goodness sir, these Swiss AKs are indeed expensive, aren't they? We'll get our finest counterintelligence team on this case as soon as possible. I have a suspicion, sir. I think I know it's the, um... Russians who were behind this. That bloody oath! Ah. <laughs> right. Hey, hey, cousin. How are you? I have your next birthday present for you. today short sleeve SG551 we go yeah let's start at 150 dead center nice okay 200 intact nice Dead center on that second shot. Nice. This one was just a touch left. So this 250 target coming up, I cannot actually see it. I could only see about the head portion of it because of the overgrown hedges. Impact. You're on the left half with that one. Nice. Okay. Like from the observation area here, we're standing up and we're, we're elevated and we can see over that berm, but Henry's proned out below us, so he cannot. All right, so I'm gonna aim for the head with a 200 meter sight. Okay. I, you actually went right over his head. Yeah, hi, dude. Over the top again. Impact up in the shoulders. Dead center on that shot. Okay, wow, I'm still at six o'clock hold. So, 
what we did with this rifle, uh, we've shot it in the past. We know that at the longer distance, it was grouping a little low uh, at the 400 and 500 targets. And so we went ahead and chewed it at the longer distances. So what you're seeing is right now, the rear sights don't entirely 100% correspond to the, uh, the shooting. But the 200 meter sight is it's still a decent uh, battlefield zero, I would say. So since that one, I had to use a base hold for those hits, I'm gonna try to cut it across the middle then. All right, so let's try 350 centered up. Okay. All right, we're on. Impact, yeah, that was still upper chest. Left wow. half of the target. Same spot. Okay. Nice. You could probably hold just slightly high on this one and be right in there. Well, this one is also slightly behind the berm, so basically what I could do is aim for what I could see out there. Okay. Which would be the upper portion. Let's try it and see what happens. Okay. Okay, elevation's perfect. You're just off the left. That's an impact. Impact. Nice. nice. Dude. Okay, so for this next one, I should probably bump it up a little bit. Okay. Well, I'm on at 450. Just underneath. Just underneath it. Good windage. Should I try the 400 meter? What sight setting were you on? Three. Yeah, maybe try clicking it up one more then. Impact. Dead on. Okay, that was high by maybe a quarter target and about almost a full target to the right. Okay. I mean, you can feel the wind. Check that wind oh, flag. Oh, now the wind is, I'm seeing it, yeah. Yep. Impact. Nice. Right half on that one. I did push it towards the left. Yeah, and it was still right half. Yeah. Ooh, that was tricky, man. Like, it, the, the wind flag was dead yep. when I pulled the trigger. Yep rolling in i think it, it's not a full value though it feels like what maybe coming from the 10 or 11 o'clock position yeah maybe maybe a little bit closer maybe like a three quarter somewhere in the three quarter zone yeah so yeah it's at 10 o'clock per se yeah all right i'm on at five that's an impact yeah buddy nice Nice. Let's see, dude. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So 20, 22 rounds. Wow, that's a clean run. That's not bad for a um, so, like less than. Basically, these things, um, these are SS or SG five five one P's. So the barrel is um, is exactly sixteen point one. However the muzzle device is machined into the barrel josh so when they turn the barrel they also machined the uh muzzle device out of the barrel so really it's closer to like a 14.5 got it so, so similar to, to our what we would do with a pin and weld normally yeah so it's basically like an m4a1 length i mean that's a ridiculous score actually then 22 yeah I mean, this thing is short sleeve is doing quite well, eh? Yeah, that was that was really sick. Let's go talk more about this in the debrief. I wanna I wanna ask you some more about this run, and then also hear more about this particular rifle's history. Yeah, we'll see you at the debrief. Well, hello there. I was only at the local Cavava searching for a delicious vintage. I hope you're enjoying the show thus far. Shows like this, they're made possible by Slate Black Industries. But more importantly, we have the support of the patrons of Patreon. That's right, this magnificent group of men and women. They support us financially, intellectually, and more importantly, emotionally. So today, I'd like to invite you, come, join us, become one of us. Together, 
we could discover the intricacies of firearms development. But if not, that's okay. We'd be just as happy to hear from you in the comments section below. But for now, let's get on with it. The SG551, the Swiss rifle, built by a Swiss company for the Swiss military, but never adopted by the Swiss military. Instead, it found heavy use in the hands of French special operations commandos. Let's delve into that. So initially, and I've got to start this by issuing a correction to a previous statement. I previously said that this was a Sturmgewehr 90 Kurz and that it was adopted but never produced. Truth is, it was never adopted nor was it produced. And the Sturmgewehr 90 Kurz was not an official term, but rather the concept that was supposed to be. Going back to the initial concept of the STG W90, though, initially the Swiss military asked for development of a long rifle, which would be the STG W90 or the SG540 that was submitted back then, and a complementing short headquarters carbine, which would be mostly using similar parts, but shorter in length uh, overall. And the SG551 was that, but due to fiscal concerns, it was never adopted by the Swiss. Understandably, this was the 90s. A lot of European militaries were going through drawdowns. And so it just was out there on the market as a just a commercial piece. Now, the French in the 70s, they did develop the FAMAS in 71, but it was going through trials. So as it was going through trials, the French needed a rifle to use as a stopgap so they could start using the 5.56 cartridge in select units. The French company Manurin uh, actually was a licensed producer of the SG540. Again, this is a precursor of the SG550. So very similar in many ways. And if you dig hard enough, you could actually find French troops running around Africa and the Middle East with the SG-540. And so for a brief period of time, a SIG pattern rifle was the official arm or the official new arm of the uh, French forces. However, the FAMAS was of course adopted, but the French still wanted a lighter and more nimble carbine for some of its forces. And these were smaller units, smaller elite units. And so units like the Commandos Marine, uh, the French naval commandos, ended up with the SG551. And for them, it would be the LB, the long barrel variant, which would be 17.8 inches with a grenade hump in the middle. So slightly longer. Uh, green furniture on gray receivers with the diopter sights. And that served them well. And subsequently, the GIGN also stepped in and wanted an SG551 SB, so the short barrel, about this short, 14 and 14.3 inches with the flash hider, using gray furniture or, or using black furniture with a either a railed front and a gray receiver and so the sg551 from then on was heavily used by french special operations forces for a while too and you can actually still find photos of uh, gign operators with sg551s all painted and really long in the tooth um, still featured in as recent as the 2000s um, in exercises. Now this particular one obviously with the green furniture on grey is closer to what the French commandos marine used, the naval commandos used. However the barrel up here is somewhere in between. It's neither the 17 and change inch barrel nor is it the super short barrel. Uh, this particular barrel is a US civilian market export 16 overall length uh, barrel with of course no threads in the end however that's how the french forces ended up 
with the SG551s. <laughs> and so, keeping with the stellar performance of the SG line, we had the 550 with a perfect ace run. If you guys haven't seen that, you have to go check that out. And then now we have the 551, which while not perfect, put up what I believe to be an exceptionally strong run for a 14 and a half inch iron sight rifle shooting 55 grain ball ammunition. I mean, this was a really darn good run. And especially because most of the misses that we encountered, I think were just related to some fiddling with the elevation and needing to get the elevation sort of sorted out a little bit as we went out. So mm -hmm. Henry, give us your initial feedback. I mean, how did you feel? Are you with me? Did you think this was a killer run? Yeah, I mean, we've, so we've shot, I think when I first got the SG551, you know, this has basically been one of those dream rifle purchases for me. I've always wanted the 551. Uh, initially, I wanted the LB, um, but I, I settled with this one. We can talk about this particular model in a bit. Yeah. Uh, but the first time we brought it out, and that was also, by the way, the first time uh, Mike B over, well, he runs uh, uh, Mike's Militaria. I don't know how he got this stuff in, but the Taz 90 uniform that I got is absolutely unobtainium out there. He somehow got a batch of those uniform jackets in. And I think that was like one of that in the Swedish camo were the first two that I got. And I was like, I want to start wearing this, you know, the coolest camo for the show. So unobtainium camo, unobtainium rifle, great run. I mean, eh. life is good. Yeah. Life is good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so back to the rifle, right? The first time I went out, I, I got this brand new, really cool looking jacket. I wanted to see, hey, how is this going to look on camera? Let's just do like a trial, like shoot. Like literally every single target we were shooting at that day, they, they were all hits as, as we were going out. Now, to compare this to a Rack M4, which you're talking about comparing this to that, which this is a brand new factory, fresh manufactured SG551. That said, it absolutely wiped the deck compared to many other carbines that we've shot out there. I honestly, this is a 16 inch on paper, but really the flash hider is machined into the barrel. So it's closer to a 14.5 pin and weld. Yeah. So which is what we had for the block one. And compared to that, it absolutely outperformed it by many ways it even outperformed a lot of the other rifles that were scoped nato rifles that had optics on them had ran a cogs and everything i think it tied with the what tied with the um, arx and the bren or something like that yeah i mean it back with a cogs yeah i mean it uh, going back to some of our really old videos like some of the very first ones that we were putting out on practical accuracy where you shot the um your original m4 on that one, I think this beat that rifle with an ACOG. And that's something I do want to talk to you about in a second and talk about how how and why you think that may have happened. But it smoked it when it came to iron sights. Because obviously you'll mm -hmm. remember way back when your, was it the Matek sight run? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, which is just not, not, a, not, not a particularly amazing. good run, not. right? <laughs> I mean, but it's also, I mean, that was my deployment MarTech that's been pretty salty. I mean, that said, I mean, it's a backup iron sight. It shouldn't have any issues holding zero. And it doesn't have any issues holding zero. It's just a backup iron sight. Right. right. From the development of the SG family going like last episode, the SG550, we talked about it coming from the joint Italian project, turning out with the SG540, which is a fixed stock much more um, fragile version of it, and then beefing it up to the 5.5.0, the 5.5.1 is actually closer in dimension-wise related to the SG540, which is the original concept that SIG came out with. Interesting. Uh, so in my opinion, by stripping down the bipod, giving it a little bit less barrel, but a little bit more nimble of a profile, that lightens up the front sufficiently to where the rifle itself ends up becoming a much more easy to use general purpose rifle. Now, of course, that takes away some of the distance features of it. 
But I'd say, Josh, from the performance, that 300 meter and in performance with this type of iron sights, it's pretty damn good. I mean, to be honest, like, I, shoot. I didn't really feel like there was all that much of a cataclysmic drop off on this run as you went out. This is probably a good place for us to transition back and talk about that. At 300 yards, we identified that the holds for elevation were not where you necessarily thought they were when we started. And we'll get into that in just a second. So you shot a few rounds high that were misses, and it was like, oh yeah, okay, well I'm holding high, my rounds are going high, need to correct that. And that was based off of, again, truing the sights out at distance and, and then bringing them back in, I think is what we determined. Um, so again, we'll, we'll swing back to that for a second. But all the way out until you got to 450, even then, I mean, at 450, you had like a couple of misses and then clean at 500. You know, I, I didn't for, see that drop off in performance characteristics that we would maybe see on a rifle that was printing a slightly larger group, maybe that we've seen on, you know, sort of true Kalashnikovs uh, that we've brought on the show in the past, where there's sort of a very obvious wall in the performance drop off of, uh, for example, the 7.62 by 3.9 guns. Um, I really didn't see that here, to be honest with you. I mean, watching it go out, it was, um, it seemed quite capable and quite effective in spite of the shorter barrel in, sti in spite of some of those uh, you know reductions in what would have otherwise been the performance profile yeah i think the the rear sights i mean that i cannot sing enough praises of the diopter type sights uh the swiss diopter sights are some of the best iterations of diopter sights out there now, I will make a complaint because that's what we do, right? We do nitpick at things. We do complain about things. Uh, these diopter sights, for some reason, they put... Basically, there's a two tritium dots in the back when you flip it to the one. And if you actually try to use it at night, that tritium, it just... It doesn't blind you, per se, but it detracts from your night vision. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. I mean, if it weren't like a... You know, a such an expensive rifle i would just take a punch and punch those things out and like black it out <laughs> but i am not going to do this to you know this this level of investment of course right uh but as far as the elevation goes i don't believe in and if you're out there if you work in uh in sig uh, let us know are there actual differences in the elevation height between the kuts and the normal p90 I'm able to confirm with Sig Sauer AG that the SG550 and the SG551 uses the same type of drum. The SG552 and the 553, the Commando, the short ones, use a different type of drums, which means that for this particular rifle, it's probably compensating for a bullet drop that is a little bit uh, for a higher velocity, meaning it's, it's dropping a little too low for this rifle. While you're saying the accuracy is fine, I did think that there was more of a rainbow arc pushing those two two three oh, cartridges out there. Absolutely. When one of the points we made in the in the five fifty debrief was watching that thing shoot, it was like a laser beam. Those were such flat trajectories on those rounds, as you would expect from a twenty plus inch barrel pushing uh, fifty five grain ammo. You're going to get a very 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 fast projectile there. It definitely didn't see the same with this particular rifle. It looked much more standard as we would expect. But to that point, I think we're probably going to have some, some viewers questioning why or how the elevation could have been off. So why don't you, you know, we alluded to it a bit while we were out there. Why don't we talk through the process of truing and why we did it and then usually how it affects things versus how it affected things on this particular run fair yeah so I, I can i can take that so the first time we took this out uh this is the first time before i had when it was still cold and i hadn't folded the sleeves up and i wanted to see how it looks how the swiss stuff looked on camera um we actually shot it at the 500 and, and i had trouble actually seeing the target and that's because I didn't true it. Basically, uh, what you what we mean by truing 
is we would zero the rifle at 100. So you get a, a pretty decent idea of wind. And then you take it out to a 400 meter range, which would correspond to our 400 yard range and uh, a 450 yard mm -hmm. distance. Mm -hmm. And we would make sure that the elevation is correct. Don't touch a windage at this point because there's going to be effect on your wind. So we make sure that the 400 meter matches a 450 yard target. And from there we continue, right? Um, ironically it was a 450 meter target that we had the most a 450 yard target we had the most misses uh but that's also uh part of it is that the sites don't 100 percent correspond to the trajectory that we see from from the cartridge and that could that could be in um, part due also to the ammunition we were shooting right i mean is this right. is this specifically designed to be to be cammed or timed up with the 63 grain swiss projectiles and if so, well, you know, maybe it's going to be slightly different with the 55s. Well, if it's if it's the Sturmgewehr 90 uh, sights, then it's not going to be timed up for anything. But I mean, it'll still be effective for 300, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's not going to be timed up for anything with a what a 30 or 40 percent barrel chop, basically. Right. Got it. Right. So by by clipping off the end of the barrel, you're already if those were the old sights, you're already sort of uh, you've already disrupted the, the design per se. So, you know, this was an exceptional run. The SG-550 was a, a really good run. And looking back at the more recent runs that we've done, I know personally I have been able to improve in my own ability to help spot the hits, call the, call the shots and whatnot. And when we compare, that's compared to when we had started this pro this project. How much would you attribute our recent heightened levels of success on runs, if we can call it that, to an increase in development of your own shooting skill as compared to just whichever firearm we're using? By doing it this much with this varied amount of firearms, uh, I do absolutely see the training value in subjecting myself into a shock of different systems and having to make them work at distances. I would say I've learned through the years to identify how much of a tolerance I have to hit a target, how much of a target presents itself, and how to maximize myself with the elements of elevation and windage according to what Josh calls out. And that itself is absolutely a skill that I have ascertained through shooting this many varied rifles. Right. So that leads me back to the point of the SG-550 and this one, the 551, neither of them printed groups that were, you know, these little tiny rat nod clusters. They were both just normal groups, yet... They performed as some of the best rifles on the run in totality. And yes, the sights are excellent as compared to some other rifles we've shot. But the ammunition we were shooting wasn't particularly great. It's ball ammunition. So in my mind, I see a lot of this going back to the concept of, as you had put it, the development of, of skill and learning over time for both of us and our ability to then do the firearm an even better service or, you know, to represent it even better on the show, which sort of leads me back to a point of suggesting that we go back and perhaps rerun some of the older runs that we've got on the show. It's something that I think we need to be looking into. I think one of the things on top of that are older runs. We typically didn't do debriefs. Uh, and we didn't have a, a chance of discussing what went right and wrong. And so we didn't have an opportunity to really delve in and improve upon that. And so uh, we do have some rifles that we would like to rerun. We would like to re-examine. And so I don't think that's a window closed. Now, Henry, I know there was one other thing you wanted to touch on here. A very famous engagement that the 551 was involved in. 
in fact, I would say one of the most famous engagements that's world known. Um, of all places, it didn't. It was actually a covert operation by a uh, former CIA operative uh, in France, of all places, by one Robert De Niro in the film Ronin, <laughs> while he was trying to bail his friend Jean Renault out of harm's way. Did this CIA operative whip out an M4? Well, they didn't exist back then, but no, he did not. He, no, no. He decided to use the local equivalent of a Commando-esque 556 that balanced the mobility, the accuracy, the firepower. He chose the SG-551 when he was trying to cover his friend. And that's right. But I, uh, for this episode, that's, that's all I have, Josh. Likewise. Now, the SG-551 has been one of my dream rifles for a long time. And for that, I've got to thank my friend William over at Ozark Bear Arms, a.k.a. Mishiko. Not only was he able to help me find this particular rifle, but uh, he was also instrumental in the research that was done on the back end story of this. And on that note, I'd also like to thank Hans Peter over at Six Hour AG for pointing some things out to us as well. And, uh, of course, JDI for bringing these in and our FFL Brandon over at the gun room for honestly indulging me in some of the crazy transfers that I sent through him. However, my friends Giga over at Polinar Tactical and Mike over at Bloke on the Range, thank you for being good sports and appearing in this collaborative effort for the skit. But also uh, Calvin over at Firepower United. Uh, thanks to him and Ian at Forgotten Weapons and their honesty and helping me develop the skit. And it's something that I, yeah, honestly, I don't know. You tell me if it's funny. But this particular rifle is about to go on a trip. How long of a trip? Let's say, how short of a trip? About this short. So she should come back with a slight weight reduction. So when she comes back, you tell us how she looks. However, in the meantime, we've got some speedway coming up. Impact! Neutralize! Impact! Neutralize! 716, this is Joe Knight 6, 4 Vic, 8 packs, red con 1, green to green, top copy, over. Joe Knight 6, this is 716, Roger, over. 1 Vic, 1, 1 pack. 